the why some experience is so specific it is heated it is dark it is candlelit there is no mirrors the music is like literally sequenced out with the playlist to match your breath and your movement the cues the teacher is giving so i was like how the hell am i going to do that on live Welcome back to the Finance Center Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Venari. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Larson-Levy, founder and CEO of Y7 Studio. In this episode, we talk about the brand's take on yoga, including heated, music-driven classes. Sarah unveils Y7's new digital platform in partnership with Universal Music Group, and she shares plans for more physical locations to continue growth. Let's get into it. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. Yeah, looking forward to chatting a lot to get into, but maybe... For folks who aren't familiar, and they probably should be, but uh, could you maybe introduce yourself quickly and just tell us about Y7, then we'll get into the details. Yeah, sure. My name is Sarah Larson-Levy. I am the founder and CEO of Y7 Studio. Uh, We are a heated vinyasa yoga studio, best known for our beat bumping, sweat dripping, candlelit yoga. You got that pretty succinctly at this point. I That's got it a... down. We're almost, <laughs> almost 10 years old. Crazily enough, I feel like I got, you know, robbed about like two years um, because of the yeah. pandemic. But yeah, we're almost 10 years old. So we've been around for a minute. Yeah, you're doing it. And I think, you know, the thing that kind of top of mind, like I mentioned for me, that stands out is just how kind of strong and differentiated, if I can even say it, the brand is. When you, like you said, now 10 years get into this. Is it a matter of saying like, I love yoga, I love music, hip hop, let's put these things together? Or is it, how does that even idea go off in your head of like, I'm going to open a studio and do it this way? Yeah. So it actually, it's, you know, it's funny now that, you know, I've been in the industry for a while and I I myself listen to a lot of um, founder stories and you always hear kind of some of the greatest ideas and companies come from a real personal need. And that's what this was for me. I have sciatica, so I deal with kind of a chronic injury that requires a lot of maintenance um, and upkeep physically to ensure that I can do things like run and, you know, participate in sports and things like that. Um, Not that I'm like, you know, on like an athletic team, but if I would want to, you know, skiing, snowboarding, that kind of stuff still holds interest for me. So, you know, so yoga has always been something that I was prompted by uh, my my doctors to do in order to kind of, you know, continue to have really great core strength and just sort of body awareness that I pinched my sciatic nerve about 12 years ago. And when that happened, I just, you know, was someone who was doing a lot, uh, a lot of spending, a lot of running, things like that, and wasn't really paying attention to the kind of smaller, more minuscule muscles in the body and how intricate they are. Um, you know, and I was 20, 25. So I was like, who cares, you know, and thought my body was invincible. but you know, that kind of injury uh, led me to trying a ton of yoga studios across the city in New York. And I I love what yoga stands for. I love this idea of a practice and something that you can really build off of and something physical that does give you all of these emotional and mental tools as well. It really is a whole like mind-body practice. And I really, I love everything it stands for. But for someone who is new to really trying to make this a regular part of their lives, I was finding a lot of like barriers that shouldn't be there. I wanted to practice. I wanted to be at a studio. But every time I went to one, I was faced with, what level are you? Mm. Have you taken this teacher? Here's a list of 20 different kinds of classes. <laughs> and I was left kind of like, I don't know. I I felt like There wasn't a real place for me to start without feeling like I was already on the outside of something, let alone as someone with an injury, you know, walking into these group classes that are bright and have all these mirrors and have all these people in them who seemingly know what they're doing. And it's really intimidating. And I was always really judgmental to myself about where I was in my practice, how I needed to be keeping up with all these other people coupled with an injury isn't the best kind of like mental space to enter into something like this. So 
a lot of those frustrations, you know, the consistency of the practice, kind of not feeling engaged with what I was doing, not feeling like the movements coincide with, you know, the music that was being played, all of it was kind of like, why isn't there something where I can move to music? Like I was at the time, like really big in a spin class and like loving, like kind of riding to the beat. And it really like the music got me through class. I don't love working out. I'm not someone who's like, such a runner's high. I love being uh-huh. out there. And it, that's not who I am. And really, that was such an important factor in getting me to love working out in a way that wasn't playing sports. And I was like, why isn't there something where we're moving to the music a little bit faster and really engaging and things like that? And that's really what Y7 is all about. It it came from every component you see in the studio came from a real personal need of mine. I didn't want to compare myself to other people. And knowing enough about anatomy now in my body, like you and I are never going to look the same in a pose. And mm-hmm. that is because we are completely different humans. We are built differently. I'm guessing we're not the same height um, mm-hmm. and have different strengths and different limits and capabilities. So there's no reason we should ever expect ourselves to look the same. So when we're told to look like this person or this is the goal of the pose, it's it's really contradictory to what yoga stands for because it's how you feel in that pose in your body. So taking away the mirrors and the ability to really use other people's bodies as the standard was really important for me because that enables you to focus on what the pose feels like in your body. Find your limit in what it feels like. Push yourself in what it feels like as opposed to what it looks like. So that's kind of the darkness, no mirrors component, handle it. And then I wanted something where I felt like I was like getting this. I wanted to trick myself. Like I always, a lot of yoga classes I went to, I was like, should I go work out now? Like, did I, was that enough? And I know that's such a weird, like, that's not the point of it, but it was something that still triggered me. And so I wanted to bring out that sweat and that heat and that movement, which is why we have the infrared technology and we practice a vinyasa style of yoga, which is breath to movement. So You're constantly moving, building heat within the body, and then the music. I think everyone can relate to that point in like when they're on their run in a class or you're spinning on a hill or whatever it is, and you're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And then that banger comes on. You're like, you know, it's like the last song, you know, it's 2 a.m. You're like, I'm going to go home at the club. And then your song comes (laughs) on. You're like, nope, one more song. Here I am. And that, like, I wanted that feeling where you're like, this is hard and like, I'm tired, but I still want to be here. And you get up and you do it and it tricks you into doing the hard things. So everything about the studio is really made to help you lose yourself really in that practice and in that movement. And you get all those benefits, surprise, and you don't have to be, you know, have this outward personality of someone who's like, I meditate, I go to yoga. Like it's not for those people. It's for the people who want it and who need it, who live a little bit like up here, who are running around frantically, who have a hard time slowing down. And I'm still that person when everyone's like, okay, clear your mind. I'm like, oh dear. Yeah. I'm like, can I have a notebook first so I don't forget everything that I have to do after this? (laughs) And it's always been harder for me to follow that cue than really just kind of being able to empty my mind by really focusing on something else. And I think that's all of those things together is I think why a lot of people resonate with Y7. It takes away all those preconceived barriers that people have about yoga. I have to be flexible. I have to look a certain way. I I have to know, you know, certain things. I have to understand these symbols or the Sanskrit. Like you get that way because you start practicing. You don't have to come in with all of that. So I really kind of, you know, as we have, we have our critics in the yoga world, but, you know, as we've grown and the studio has been around longer, what I really look at it like is kind of this gateway to everything that yoga can be and all the deeper learnings. It's not just a physical practice. There is so much more, but you can start here. And I think that's great for a lot of people, you know, and it's really meant to be a space where we meet our clients where they are not the other way around. Yeah. I think as you're talking about it, there are probably a lot of people 
like me listening that are nodding their head and <laughs> thinking about, you know, maybe having had a similar experience and even myself coming to it from a much different place, which is just like, I understand the benefits of yoga. I don't do it. You know, the flexibility, the moving, feeling my body, isolating the muscles nearly as much as I should. I would like to have that kind of connection better. But even when I first started trying to go to classes, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know where I should go. I don't understand what they're saying. Like, it doesn't feel like it's for me. Um, even though, you know, now there's yoga studios kind of all shapes and yeah. sizes right on different corners. When you were initially kind of conceiving of this and getting started, and we'll, we'll get kind of jump ahead to the current day here too, but was it coming to it from the perspective of identifying this kind of opportunity, what was missing, what you would like to see, and then saying like, I'm going to open X number of studios or was it just like, I'm going to open a studio and like, we're going to get this moving yeah. and like see what happens. <laughs> this is actually... I like I kind of like am in love with my own founder story because I mm -hmm. was just like complaining for like a year and um he was my boyfriend at the time he's now my husband was like he's like a serial entrepreneur the guy has probably like 12 open LLCs in Delaware then I'm like can we pop this now can we we good we need, still need to pay that one but for that one he was like why don't we just open our own and I was like that's crazy I was like that it's not what people do. And he was like, no, 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 like, let's find a space and like, see if we can do this. And the great thing about New York is that like, there's so much opportunity, right? There's so much opportunity to like, collaborate and find these spaces. And we actually started as a pop up. We rented a and it was actually this is very like serendipitous now for where we are today. But it was a recording studio. And they recorded mostly instrumentals. So they had this big room that was soundproofed had speakers, no windows because they were all covered in soundproof because it was right off Roebling in Williamsburg. And it was just, they didn't use it on the weekends. It was like the perfect space for us. So we rented that two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday. And we did that for all of July in 2013. And at the end of like our pop-up, someone asked to buy a package. And I was like, well, uh, <laughs> I was like, um, we're working on finding our permanent space, but like, I'll take your email yep. and I'll let you know. And that was really like, should we find a space? Like people want to buy a package. And we found a great month to month spot again in Williamsburg. It was just a 300 square foot, like artist loft. And we held classes there and we opened that in September of 2013 and just started, you know, running classes just before work, after work, what, Myself and Mason could kind of handle checking in and, you know, being there for. And that was it. It was that way. I kept my career. I worked in fashion. I worked in my career for two full years until we opened Flatiron, which was our third location. And my husband continued to work his until about six months after I left my job. And we decided to go all in and, you know, make this a thing and a real business. So it happened really just... It was an easy decision for us. Like I, I love what we do. I love how we practice. I love our community. And I was so, after watching how other people connected with what we were doing in the room, I was like, yeah, like let's do this. And if anything, it's a fun little side project. And yep. cool, I have a yoga studio. I'm like, that's fun. <laughs> and it ended up becoming, you know, something that people really enjoy and you know want to have as a regular part of their life so i've been very fortunate that you know what i was feeling as a personal gap in the market has resonated with so many people and there were so many people who felt left out of a space they wanted to be included in yeah there's when you kind of going back to that time you you mentioned like even after you did the pop-ups get to the third studio you're thinking about growth. When, what year was that? You said like 2013, 2014? That was 2015. By the time okay. I left so, my, yeah, by the time I left my job, yeah. Yeah. From that point, maybe even between then and pandemic, what was the kind of peak number of studios that in terms of like expansion and getting, yeah. you know, continuing to grow? We had, sadly, pandemic, we, um, when everything got shut down, in the world. We had just opened our third market in Chicago. Uh, we had been open for three days. Wow. And we're forced to shut it down. That was our 14th studio location. So, And then what's the current today? Today we have six. 
Um, okay. Chicago, we only had that one, which we had to end up closing. We had 11 uh, in New York and two in LA. So we consolidated those. I was very, very lucky to have a killer team, you know, who was my team who was going to take us from, you know, those 14 studios to 30. That was my team who was going to do that. And I had people on my team who made, you know, helps you make some really, really smart financial decisions. So we were, you know, we consolidated leases. We kind of terminated early. Once we saw that this was not going to be, you know, a six week shutdown, like so many of us thought it was going to be once it kind of got into that September October 2020 phase, you know, we made some tough but really quick decisions regarding our locations and leases and what was going to kind of hold and what was our strongest and made some cuts there. So we have six today, uh, one in LA, five in New York, um, but have been working on some fun stuff in lieu of physical expansion. So, yeah, I want to get to kind of the, I get hopefully post COVID or at least on the other side of it or whatever we're calling it and, and hopefully looking forward. So we'll get to the kind of physical and what comes next. But in that span too, I also wanted to maybe hear you talk about at what point does it, you know, you're getting traction. People want to buy passes. You're opening studios, you know, you and your husband or at the time, maybe fiance or boyfriend, but decide to go all in. Then it, and this is probably when it, it at least got on my radar. And then I think started to kind of break through, more is like ex celebrity loves Y7 yoga or like this person shows up there and this, you know, kind of collaboration comes yeah. up. Was that, I guess, intentional, surprising? How did that get you know, like kind of get, you know, resonate with you in terms of like, oh, this is like a different thing in terms of how the brand is being perceived and who it's resonating with? Yeah, it was actually pretty surprising. We, um, we did have, you know, when we first in probably about the summer of 2015, we did have PR, like a PR agency for a little bit. But I found that what was happening, even with editors and influencers and things like that, scheduling someone to go to a thing, especially to work out after work and after a full day or yeah. before work is really tough. And people feel obligated to come. Maybe they're not in the right space. And, you know, there was a lot of coordination. And so, I really just started, you know, when we kind of started to get word out that way, a little bit more traditional press, it was more sort of like, I'm going to give you a five pack. You come with if you want. So we stopped doing a lot of like, we tested some PR for about three months. We stopped doing it because I really wanted people to come when they wanted to come. And if you want, if you want to write about it, great. If you don't like, that's okay. And like, I want you to like it. Like, I don't want this to be something that you're doing for a favor for somebody else. Like, I want you to like it. And like, mm. I know that like, not everything is for everybody. So, you know, if people are going to write about it and come, I want it to be because they want to be there. Sure. And that ended up working really well for us. We, um, we've never paid for influencer or celebrity. We work on more of a gifting basis. So, and if you love it, you love it. And like, I'm happy to have you keep coming. And the celebrity thing was, it was, it has always been really, really funny to me because I think they enjoy the, you know, the privacy of mm. the darkness and wear a hat in and do their thing and they can leave. And so it's always funny when, you know, celebrities get photographed in any of the merch or like coming out of a location or things like that, because we don't talk about it. Cause I was like, I don't know if like, people are always staring at me and like, it's dark in here and I don't come in here because it's dark and I don't want you to look at me anyways. So we've always really tried to kind of respect our clients' privacy on that end and just kind of let the experience speak for itself. You know, if they talk about it and want to share about it, I think that's amazing. And we adore our celebrity clients, but I really want to also make sure that it's still a welcoming community for everybody else too, right? And that's what Y7 for me is about so much as that community and the experience that you have and, you know, in this kind of movement together. But it's been really fun to see who who comes and who like continues to come and who likes it. Um, so it's fun. Diplo is a big client of ours. And I didn't know he was going to be a yogi, you know, and I think but that's like part of it. I think you people surprise themselves with being able to do a class like that and a group class like that while still having your like anonymity a little bit mm -hmm. without having to worry about 
paparazzi or people looking at you or taking pictures. And honestly, like I have to say, like our clients were incredible and like no one's ever bothered like anyone for like a picture or anything like that. So um, and I'm really proud of that. And I think that's something that's really special that maybe, you know, that that population of people doesn't get all the time. Yeah, really good vibes. And and I think, like you said, uh, the music part certainly resonates with them and, and the brand and down that path ahead of talking about the looking forward piece. Uh, I also wanted to talk about the kind of lifestyle brand aspect of it, right? When you start doing merch drops and start doing collabs and start doing things from that side, how were you able to kind of do that? How did you approach it saying like, there's an interest among the kind of clientele for this, but also doing it in a way where it it is true to the brand and I'm sure true to you and and doing it in a way that it, it, it feels exclusive is not the word exclusive in the sense that like, it's for a certain type of person and it's the type of person that wants to be at Y7. Yeah. Um, so what was the, the branding aspect and how do you think about continuing to, to kind of build that lifestyle brand? Yeah, I, I think something interesting that always um, stood out to me when going into yoga studios, um, you know, more traditional studios, it's like very bright. There's like this almost like you can tell, right? If you, one of my favorite things to do is, well, I don't like do this often, but one of my favorite things to like have people do when they like want to talk about the brand is like if you Google yoga and then Google Y7 yoga, the difference is absolutely insane. And like ours is all very like black and white, gritty and tough and sweaty and like how you look in a yoga class. Like no one looks cute in chair pose. Like everyone's face is like, you know, like really trying to like hold it together. Like no one looks great in a scorpion pose. Like these are really tough poses to hold, you know, as opposed to the serene, like sunset in the background, just so relaxed. And, um, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about kind of the realness in that moment. And that's what I really wanted the brand to reflect too, is that like, this doesn't just have to be like, when you say yoga, I think there's an image that comes to everybody's mind. And I really wanted to change that and what that looks like, because I think that is such a specific small group of people that that image kind of relates to. And I wanted to show that you can be any size, your practice can look like whatever it looks like at the time, whatever place you're in in your life, it's going to look different. It's going to look different from day to day. It's going to look different from morning to night. And that's okay. And I wanted it to be more of a realistic approach to what we all look like. And that was a part of, you know, really simplifying the brand too. All of our spaces have really neutral color palettes. The black and white was really just meant to kind of take out all of this. And I don't want to say that it's like, I, and I say this, I can't think of a better way to do it, but a lot of people use the word like crunchy granola to like describe yoga and like, sure, it can be if you want it to, but it's also a really difficult and challenging physical and mental practice. And it doesn't have to be just this one thing. And so by kind of flipping it on its head, it's really forced people to look at yoga in a different way, which I think is more accurate to how it is. It's like, it's hard. It's really hard. And I wanted, I wanted it to be more of like this lifestyle of working really, really hard, finding those moments of peace within your practice, within the chaos of the city and the dirt and the grit and all of that. Like you can still have those moments to yourself, right? And that's what I think about when we look at how we're, you know, producing merch or we're looking at collaborations and things like that. It doesn't have to be all these bright colors or pastels or, you know, incense or whatever it is. It can just be like you in your favorite like workout clothes, like doing your thing. And I think that's, you know, an Im important way to help kind of change the lens uh, that so many people have when they hear yoga. Yeah. And it's, you know, to your point, kind of stuck with people and been able to survive the pandemic. And now thinking about continuing maybe expansion on new fronts. Yeah. I know you're kind of planning digital offering, yeah. like rethinking about how you engage people in a world where maybe they want options at home or on the go. Sure. Um, so we'd be curious to hear about that. And also if there is kind of a thought to get back to that physical expansion as well, and maybe what the roadmap looks like. Yeah. So, you know, kind of when COVID hit, like everybody else, we were like, 
we don't have any rev. We have nothing. If the physical studios are, we don't have anything. So like a lot of studios, we quickly pivoted for a digital offering, um, you know, set up a platform for that. We, we built it out, started recording, recording within three weeks and it's been fine. But what I had always stayed away from digital and thinking about digital in the future pre-pandemic because the Y7 experience is so specific. It is heated. It is dark. It is candlelit. There is no mirrors. The music is like literally sequenced out with the playlist to match your breath and your movement and the cues the teacher is giving. So I was like, how the hell am I going to do that online? Like, am I supposed to give like a little disclaimer? It's like, turn off your lights now. Make sure 10 to 15 minutes before class, you turn off that heat in your room, cover all your heat. It feels like I would be setting up people's expectations incorrectly if I was like, this is going to be just as good as in studio. Like, that's not correct. I very much believe, especially after the pandemic that are going through it, that nothing compares to an in-person experience. It just doesn't. You know, we, we tried it with concerts and all the things. It was like a really great effort when we were all kind of tuning into that stuff. But there's just something different about being in person. As we got more into late 2020 and we really saw kind of the patterns and habits of our consumers changing, even as things were starting to open up again, I really started to think about what our digital play looks like in the long run. Do I think that everyone's just going to stop going in studio? No. I think people are so happy to be back. They're excited to be back. But I do think we were mandated closed by the government for 18 months and people's habits shifted in that time. People's work situations shifted. People's personal situations shifted. A lot of people moved. A lot of people are hybrid office now and everyone's lives changed and we got into new habits. We started doing new things. And again, what's important to me, and I've always had this philosophy with our clients and how we practice is also like, I we also need to meet them where they are. And so how can we provide a digital offering that is not going to replace what we do in the studio, but rather add to it? Because there's a lot of people who I think, you know, are going in-person stuff like two, three times a week where like early 2020, my, I was at a studio five days a week. Like I was there. I was like, whether it be <laughs> Pilates, spin, yoga, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to class. Goodbye. Working out at home. Like, no, not doing that. No, thank you. But my my life has changed also. I'm about to have a second child too. So like I don't have time to go to an hour-long workout every day like I wish I did. Um, but it's really interesting. So we spent a lot of time thinking about like, okay, like how can we add to our experience, build something that is true to Y7, but also different and more expansive than what we do in the studio. So I'm very excited that November 30th, we are going to be formally announcing our partnership with Universal Music Group. We will be the first yoga forward platform to have synced and integrated music licensing. So we will have similar offerings to Peloton, um, Equinox Plus, things like that. So the biggest thing that I realized with our experience is that it's going to be the music. You know, I can't can't make everyone practice in a dark room. You, you know, if someone's practicing, want, it's a great day outside, you want to practice on your deck, who am I to stop you? <laughs> Please, <laughs> go ahead. You know, and the same thing with the heat. So what really tied it for me, and I think what, you know, we ran a couple surveys um, with our current client base, and what was the most impactful thing during the practice is the music and the ability to move and breathe with the beat and use that as your form of motivation and the cadence for how you're moving in class and when you should be speeding up, when you should be slowing down, all of those cues. So we are very excited to relaunch our digital platform with the licensing. It has been a very long process. So we are so, so stoked that it is finally happening and that we have such an incredible partner in Universal. And you know, now with the digital platform, we're able to offer 30 minute, 45 minute, 15 minute kind of class offerings as opposed to just the traditional 60 minute. You know, when you're doing something at home, it should be on your schedule, not the studios. So for me, that was really important too to have all these different time offerings and 
maybe a vinyasa, maybe something a little bit slower, maybe something focused on, you know, just upper body strength or shoulder opening and whatever that is. So there's going to be a ton of content for everybody to explore. We have been um, since for the last two months, we've been filming on a cadence about 80 videos a month. So we turned our second studio on the Upper East Side into a purely filming studio. We have refitted it uh, purely for recording and have been working really, really hard on getting some amazing content up for the platform and, you know, releasing that so everyone can kind of explore and also have this really great hybrid platform too on the tech side. So rebuilt all of our tech too on the back end. So a lot, I think a lot of people share my frustrations with how we are forced to have like 20 different accounts, but all through the same platform. Doesn't make any sense. We should all have a single dashboard and be able to pick our studios, but I will leave that there. So with the Y7 online platform, you will be able to log into your account. You can book physical classes. You can take your digital classes on the same thing. There is no switching. There is no going to a different browser. You will have your playlist in there. You will be able to shop in there. You will be able to see all of your in-class credits. You can see your on-demand history that you've taken. Everything you can imagine is in one place. And that is it. And you can do whatever you need to do from that one spot. So it'll be really fun to be able, you know, to engage our clients who maybe, you know, are only in the city now three days a week and want to still go to the studio and practice once or twice a week at the studio when they're in the city. And then, you know, Connecticut, Long Island, wherever they are, they can do their at-home stuff the other times and get their 15 to 45 minutes in or whatever it is they want to do. We also have a lot of clients who moved and who maybe don't have their physical studio close by who can have an online membership and still feel a part of the community and participate in challenges and, you know, music themed classes we're able to do now um, online, which will be really, really fun. Um, And we have a lot of fun stuff coming up with some artist collaborations too early next year. It's huge. It's a huge to get the the music licensing piece, especially given the role that music plays in your experience. And, you know, when you think about what it's it's been an interesting conversations I've had with folks like Joey from Berries and Ryan at Solid Core and like talking to them about like, listen, what we do isn't for at home. We can do a version of what we do outside of the studio, but like people want to be in the studio and like, we want to give them something kind of ancillary around that. And yes, maybe we engage people the first time they meet us is through the app, but then they make their way to the studio and, you know, things like that. So I think it's, it's interesting to think about not so much this digital replacing or at home replacing studios. It's like, there are some things, some aspects of some studio experiences that cannot be replicated beyond the human interaction and the social and the things that go along with that just from the experience side. So this is, I think, even going so far as to integrate it into one app so that it feels like a cohesive experience, you know, a a huge step, I think, down this path of kind of redefining what that maybe bundle or hybrid or omni-channel, whatever people want to call it, looks like in the future. That is going to be the future. People are, you know, travel stopped for a while, but People are traveling a little a little bit more. I currently don't live in New York or LA where our studios are. We ended up in Austin during the pandemic for it was a whole accident, but we ended up loving it. And so for the moment, we're here. But I'm in New York now. I'm in New York once a month. So for me, for people like myself who are able to work remote but still go into their headquarters or cities, you know, once, twice a month, it's really important to be able to not just have that connection when you're physically there, but continue that connection and that feeling of belonging to a community, even when you're unable to physically be there. I think, in my opinion, that is where the future is going to go. Just looking at my own habits, looking at the habits of friends who are still very involved in the boutique fitness world and what we want. But knowing that, you know, just again, I think people's habits changed. Mm -hmm. And we saw what we were capable of at home and what we could do on our own time. And people's, I think, priorities shifted too with how they want to spend their time. And so we really, again, just wanted to be able to kind of be there in a digital way, not replace it, but be there in a way that, you know, we're still here. 
to support you, even if you're not physically at the studio. So it's been interesting to see kind of where the fitness world will go, especially in the boutique world. You know, there's some really, really strong, incredible brands out there. And it's hard to know like what people are going to want next. I think we were at like the height of like boutique fitness when this all happened. There were, I mean, there was a fitness studio in New York on like every corner. Yeah. Like you could, there's always somewhere to work out. And now it's a little bit different. It's a little more, people are a little bit more specific and there's a lot less. So. Yeah. And and maybe to that point, one more question before we get out here. Is it obviously this kind of digital effort, bringing this together, thinking about the hybrid future is huge. And uh, I think a massive step, but is there this given the economic climate and how things are going to continue? Is it like, Hey, we want to get back into opening a bunch more studios or that being kind of the goal where you plant your flag or is it kind of still figuring that out as things evolve? No, I think the physical expansion is definitely very important to me still. I think what's interesting now is that we're able to use the data from our digital to inform where we should physically open. Like where are people? Because my friend group who was in New York beginning of 2020, 70% are gone. You know, we have best friends who moved to Vegas. We have friends who moved to Orange County, Miami, back, like I grew up in Michigan, so back home in the Midwest, like who were never planning on leaving the city. So it's also like, where are people really resonating with this? What do they want? Is this the next opportunity as opposed to, I used to be able to like know where I wanted to open in New York, like clockwork. I was like, where's the subway? I was like, (laughs) let me see subway map. And I got this. But it's a little bit different now. So I think using all of our digital data, too, to really inform how we want to physically expand and really taking cues more so from our clients rather than looking at just straight like geos and demos and what that is and banking on kind of that population, just being a little bit more strategic and thoughtful about how we want to physically open. Um, For me, more of an opportunity to open in what were more secondary, like tertiary markets, which I always felt really kind of strongly about. You know, I don't, (laughs) I've always been into Nashville, always been into the Atlantas, Austin, things like that. So I'm really excited to get into those cities and those communities too. I think those are going to be really important markets for us moving forward. Yeah, maybe get back into that early pop-up game again and and start just seeing what the reception is and doing it and try it out. Yeah. I think it's, it's huge opportunity. And, and because like, listen, some, unfortunately businesses didn't survive. As you said, like even New York, you walk around you're like, it's not a studio or yoga on every corner. Like it was for a minute there. Um, so there will be additional opportunities on that front too. And whether it's those secondary markets or some of the cities that maybe were further down the list, like yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, I, it's it's going to be really interesting and and changes the way I think we thought about expansion. Right, we were very early twenty twenty focused on New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, DC, Philly, a lot of the more urban markets. Um, you know where there was a really large demographic of younger working professionals, and that's changed a lot. And, you know, so it'll be it's definitely changed our strategy for how we want to and how we think about physical expansion. Are we going for just two or three really strong flagship locations in each city as opposed to, you know, 11 in New York? I don't think I'd ever do 11 in New York. Like it was just and that was just Manhattan and Brooklyn. I don't know if I could do that again. I just don't know if the numbers are there like they were before. So and I think a lot of studios made that call too to shut some down and kind of consolidate those locations, you know, having studios. We had our Flatiron Union Square studio were only like 10 blocks apart and they both crushed. And I don't know if that would be the case again. So, you know, we'll see. It'll be really interesting to see how kind of that physical expansion plays out. Hoping to restart that, um, you know, in the beginning of next year after we get through kind of our big digital launch and get through that and going back to doing just one thing at a time. And you know, physical expansion and brick and mortar locations are still definitely big, a big, big part of the business and really important. Yeah, I guess, you know, this is a good place. We'll, we'll, we'll get you out of here and wrap up, but you have the great timing on the, the digital launch, right? Christmas and New Year. 
and yeah. then thinking about things going forward. So for people who want to check it out, see what the, the kind of digital products like, get back and see you in person, uh, where would you point them? What's the best way to kind of get them involved? Yeah, everything will be everything. Your class packages, your digital needs. Y7-studio.com will be your place to go. November 30th, everything launches and we'll be up and running. We'll have those hybrid packages. We will have, you know, just digital and still, of course, our just physical me studio memberships as well. So stay tuned for that, which will be really fun. And then keep a lookout for us physically expanding next year. We will be keeping tabs on it. Appreciate you making some time to chat with us today. Super excited to share the conversation. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.